Starship has been stacked again. Is this time for good? SpaceX also have a new Starlink service for the super rich and former NASA administrator Jim Bridenstine is back. This is tomorrow's space news. As always, let's start off by heading down to South Texas and see what SpaceX have been up to with the Starship program. Firstly, ship number 25 was rolled out of the high bay and taken to the production site via Highway 4. The next day, ship 24 decided it wanted to be back on top of the booster once again, so it was lifted by the chopsticks onto the super heavy booster. Simultaneously, ship 25 was joining in on the lifting action, being placed onto suborbital pad A in preparation of ambient and cryogenic proof testing. This ship currently does not have any Raptor engines installed, which means that the pre-burner and spin prime tests are not currently on the table, but SpaceX needs to make sure that S25 can actually hold some propellant first. It's something which I commented on last week, and we have a full speed retraction test to look at. This footage isn't sped up, this is real time, ship quick disconnection action. Ship 24 and 25's younger sibling, number 26, is still currently in bits at the production site, however its nose cone has been spotted rolling into high bay 1, so could we be seeing some stacking action soon? Let me know what you think in the comments. And for good measure, Ship 27's nose cone has appeared as well. Let's not neglect Booster 7 this week, although the primary excitement has been with the ships. This Raptor 2 was seen being taken to the launch site last week, and overnight it was installed onto the business end of the booster. Whilst suborbital pad A is occupied, pad B has been seeing some upgrades and repairs, presumably to ensure it is fit for purpose for future testing of ships. I think it is safe to bet that once the orbital flight test is out of the way, SpaceX will want a decent cadence of test flights with Starship, so making sure you can get ships tested quickly is a necessity for that to happen. Starbase hasn't been getting all of the fun action though, as just seven hours up the road in McGregor we've been seeing multiple rapid relight tests of Raptors. Now I don't have the time to go through every single one of them, if you want to do that then I'd recommend you go and watch NASA Space Flight's full McGregor roundup for this week, but I will show you one. After a long burn, the engine shuts down, waits a few seconds and then relights. It's a very simple concept which is required for the belly flop manoeuvre and landing on planets and moons. Are you really rich? Do you want to have high speed internet on your plane? Well, I have the answer for you, Starlink Aviation. SpaceX have launched this premium service starting at a reasonable $12,500 per month, ranging up to $25,000 per month, which will allow you to access up to 350 megabits per second of bandwidth whilst in the air. The sleek new aero terminal, which you'll need to bolt to the top of your plane, is obviously not included in those monthly figures, so you'll need to fork out an additional $150,000 just for that as well. Comparing that to the ground-based high-end business service, for the same speeds as the aviation service, it's $500 USD per month for the service and an upfront $2,500 for the dish. For the maritime service, it's $5,000 per month for the service and an upfront of $10,000 for the dish. So it's a big price hike for an altitude and speed increase. This new service will start rolling out next year, allowing low latency gaming, high quality zoom calls and whatever else jet owners get up to on the internet at 30,000 feet. The Polaris program, the three private flights funded by Jared Isaacman, has announced the science experiments and the research which they will be conducting on their first mission, Polaris Dawn. 38 different projects have been chosen from 23 different partners, helping to increase our knowledge on how humans adapt, live and work in space. Now I would like to explain each and every one to you, but sadly I don't have all day, so I'll just give you the list of the lucky folks who have gotten their experiments onto this flight. Those are in alphabetical order, Baylor College of Medicine, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth, Johns Hopkins University, KBR Level X, Keck School of Medicine of USC, Medical College of Georgia and Augusta University, Medical University of South Carolina, NASA, Nebula Research and Development and the International Institute for Aeronautical Sciences, Ottawa Hospital Research Institute, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, Space Team Neoterix, CMU, DU, SpaceX, a SpaceX and NASA joint mission, a SpaceX and University of Calgary joint mission, University of Colorado Boulder, University of Hawaii, United States Air Force Academy, UT Health, and Viacornell. 
The full list of experiments is available on the Polaris website, which as always is linked below. And to round up this week's SpaceX update, SpaceX have released this image of the business end of the USS F-44's Falcon Heavy inside the hangar at LC-39A. Hopefully it's not too long until all 27 Merlins ignite for the first time in over three years. I was talking last week about how Ariane Space had stacked the first Ariane 6 on the launch pad and even though it is a test article, it's still progress. The maiden launch of the Ariane 6 has sadly slipped though all the way to one year from now, which has provoked ESA into moving an Ariane 6 mission over to a Falcon 9. Hera, the follow-up mission to DART, which smashed an asteroid just a few weeks back, has been moved over to a Falcon 9, even though it is scheduled for launch at the end of 2024. This is a disappointing move away from the idea that Europe should be launching their own payloads. However, according to ESA's Director of Science, Gunter Hasinger, being able to confirm a launch date on a Falcon saves money that could be spent waiting around for an Ariane 6. It isn't just Hera, however, as Euclid, a cosmology and telescope mission destined for Lagrange Point 2, just like James Webb, has had to be moved over to a Falcon 9 as well. This isn't because of the Ariane 6 though, in this case it's because of the Soyuz flights taken away from French Guiana. Some other missions have already or could be impacted by Ariane 6's delays and Russia's retraction of Soyuz flights, such as the science mission Earthcare, which has had to be moved over to a Vega C from a Soyuz. ESA's GPS equivalent, the Galileo constellation, has to resume launches in 2023 or 2024 to keep the constellation at its best. Currently destined for the second flight of Ariane 6, the final decision point has been marked as halfway through next year. ExoMars is another payload that was talked about quite a lot back in February, which was intended to launch last month on a Proton rocket. The new plan is to launch ExoMars in 2028 after building a new descent module because they can't use the Russian one anymore. It has also confirmed that even with a multi-year delay, the science gathered by ExoMars would still be valuable. Former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine is back in the space business, joining Firefly Aerospace's advisory board effective immediately. During his tenure at NASA, he oversaw the creation of the Artemis program and continued the support for the various commercial programs, which makes him a very valuable asset for Firefly. At the start of the month, they successfully reached orbit for the first time on just their second flight of the Alpha rocket. This saw them beat SpaceX, who only reached orbit on the fourth time of asking, and match Rocket Lab, who also reached orbit successfully on their second ever mission. With the announcement, Jim Bridenstine said, quote, Firefly has an exceptional team that is building an impressive track record of success, and I'm excited to have the opportunity to help guide Firefly during this dynamic phase of its growth and development. I look forward to advising Firefly on how they can better position the company to take advantage of the tremendous opportunities available in today's fast evolving space economy. A couple of weeks back on the 12th of October, you may remember that Japan attempted to launch their Epsilon rocket for the sixth total time. This specific flight was the PBS variant, which has only ever flown twice, the second flight being this recent flight, which failed to make it to orbit. Preliminary data and some assumptions led us to believe that the flight termination system was activated just before the third stage separated from the second. Now before the stages separate, there is a planned coast phase for just over a minute. During this time, RCS thrusters are meant to keep the vehicle pointing in the correct direction. However, during this flight, that was not the case. It kept deviating off course and the team on the ground decided to trigger the FTS, ripping the rocket to shreds for it to fall into the Philippine Sea. This is the first failure of the Epsilon, although it is only its sixth ever flight. A 1 in 6 record isn't the best, but hopefully with more successful flights over the coming years, Japan can trust this vehicle to be a valuable asset to its domestic rocketry capabilities. We're starting off this week's traffic with another Starlink launch, this one in particular being Starlink Group 4 Mission 36. It launched at 14.50 Universal Time on the 20th of October from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, marking SpaceX's 100th successful launch from this pad. This flight was carrying 54 Starlink satellites, which were all delivered to their 332 by 231 kilometer, 53.22 degree inclination low Earth orbits. From here, those which are alive and well will raise themselves up to a 540 km circular orbit over the coming months. The Falcon 9 booster supporting this mission, B-1062, landed for the tenth time in its life on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. Both fairing halves were scooped out of the water by support ship Bob. 
1920 UTC on the 21st saw this rare boosterless Soyuz 2.1V launch two classified Russian military satellites from Site 4234 at the Prozets Cosmodrome in Russia. The satellites, Cosmos 2561 and 2562, were delivered to a sun-synchronous orbit. Due to the classified nature of the flight, our knowledge ends there. Next up, it was Starlink competitor OneWeb's return to flight, launching their 14th mission on an Indian GSLV Mark III. The ISRO launched this mission for the satellite operator at 18.37 UTC the next day, the 22nd of October, from Launch Pad 2 at the Satish Devan Space Center in India. All 5,015 kilos of the 36 satellites were delivered to a polar orbit and they'll be raising themselves up to 1,200 kilometers over the coming months. It's another Soyuz flight now, this time being the 2.1B variant. This mission lifted off at 1957 UTC on the same day, the 22nd, carrying the Goliath M33, M34 and M35 and Skiff D payloads from Site-1S at the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia. The three Goliath satellites are in addition to the Goliath communication constellation at an altitude of 1,400 kilometers. Skiff D, however, an internet demonstration satellite, was delivered to an 8,700 kilometer medium Earth orbit. The upcoming departures for this week is an ISS resupply mission, Progress MS-21 launching from Baikonur, a Falcon 9 with Starlink Group 431 from Vandenberg, a Long March 4C with the Aragon 3403 from Jiquan, a Long March 5B, China's heavy lift rocket carrying Minshin, one of the modules for their Tiangong space station, and then we should have hopefully USS F-44, the return to flight of the Falcon Heavy next Monday. Thank you to all of the citizens of tomorrow who help to financially support the show once a month. There are many levels to choose from, all at different price points from as little as one US dollar a month. In return, you get to see new scripts as they're being written, exclusive member hangouts and much more. So if you want to, head to join.tomorrow.tv and add your name to this list. Want more from tomorrow? Well, you're in luck as there's plenty coming over the week. On Wednesday, Dr. Tamitha Scove will be back with a weather update telling us what the sun's been up to. On Friday, at least me and Jared will be behaving very seriously on our weekly live show and technically it's already out, but if you want to see something right now, why not check out our first documentary about how Britain could have won the space race. That's available at the link in the corner of your screen. You know how to make sure you don't miss any of that, but for now, thank you for watching and goodbye.